Hi guys, bear with me. See how this thing works. Okay. So I just, I'm going back now. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, so actually, originally our CEO Jesper was meant to be here, but he he kind of spent the whole last month getting drunk and had to go to the ER, so he, he sent me instead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm kind of new to this, so I, ho I hope you can bear with me. Um, uh, I'm Thomas Howard, uh, as said, uh, the head of mechanical engineering at Teenage Engineering. Um, and I'm here today to present to you the X-Files of Teenage Engineering. Uh, I guess to me that means uh, that I should probably have a look at uh, kind of some of the experiments and projects that we've done and, and maybe some of the thought processes behind that. Um, I, I think it's easiest to start with our logo. It's a nut and a bolt. Um, we're pretty simple in the way that we do things and uh, I think this is a good way of, of showing that. Who are we? Uh, we're engineers, 35 of them. Software, electronics, mechanical engineers, industrial designers. And we're mostly experimenting with consumer electronics. Um, and for the successful experiments, we're also doing the sales and logistics side of things. So uh, we're really proud of that, having the whole chain uh, in-house. It's a really essential part of our creative process. Uh, I wouldn't say that we're startup guys or entrepreneurs, anything like that. Uh, I think what we wanted to do was create a platform where maybe life could be a little bit more interesting or inspiring. So we have this studio in Stockholm uh, where we build a lot of stuff. It's mostly products, but it's also a place where we can kind of work on other, other projects that we might find fun. Uh, when we create something, we start from the ground up. So that means starting with the space, with the people, with the tools. Uh, we like to keep things open and free so that we can kind of move stuff around and explore these ideas freely. We love collaborations. Um, maybe we don't, we're certainly not experts at textiles, but maybe we can trade some code for some clothes. We do that kind of thing a lot. Uh, collaborations are also a really great way to meet people. Here you have uh, our head of audio engineering. He's doing some acoustic measurements with a consultant and they're like best friends now. So I, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, this is like a, a typical workspace, uh, something that you might find in our office. We also have a big machine park. That's really important to us. Uh, basically we have this idea that you know, if you have an if you if you have an idea, you, you should be able to explore that without any limitations. That's really important to us. We're also not so big on on thinking. We learn with our hands. Uh, you know, so so we maybe make ten prototypes, throw them around the office. How many people pick them up? That's a really good way of of building a genuine interaction with an object and and kind of. Yeah, I, I think that's cooler than you know thinking about it a lot and staring at a computer screen. This is a PCB from, from our first product called the OP1, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more about later. Uh, on the other side of the PCB, we actually printed a, a, a map of Manhattan. What that means is that if we have a faulty board, we can say something like, we have a short down on the Lower East Side. We're, we're very much a, a, like a, a cross-functional team, so we're always working towards developing ways of common understanding. We also have a small warehouse. We have bigger ones in, in Hong Kong and LA, uh, but I think the reason we still have a warehouse in Stockholm is that it, when you build a product, it's, it, it's really, really nice to be able to see the full cycle. So we see all the boxes coming in and, and we see the products getting shipped out to customers and, and that's really, really inspiring, I think. We also work a little bit on cars and, and motorcycles. Uh, I guess you could say that for most of us, work and life are one. It, it's not really that we don't have lives outside of work, more that we're not afraid to bring life into work and into our workplace. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background on some of the projects that we've done. Um, the first one was uh, like a family of 22 singing dolls. They had these kind of synthetic voices and, and uh, like a kind of artificial intelligence so they could, 
they can take lyrics that you would log on to a website and, and put in, maybe you put in your favorite lyrics to like Dr. Dre's Bitches Ain't Shit or something like that. And then it uses like, uh, yeah, th th these rules based on 13th century choral arrangements to, to generate melodies and harmonies and arrange this in a musical way. So uh, I think I have one of my favorite ones here recorded. Uh, <laughs> I think that's really nice. <laughs> we also did a like a project for IKEA. We did the world's cheapest camera. It was made from cardboard, and I think it sold for about nine euros or something like that. But, but eventually, I, I think you, yeah, we kind of got bored of doing consultancy work. We hated being tied to a client, uh, and we wanted to create something for ourselves. So, so this led us to create the OP1, which is the synthesizer I was just playing from then. We had this idea of creating, a, yeah, a, a super powerful tool, a musical tool that wasn't just for synth geeks. Uh, you, you know, you didn't have to be a scientist to use it. The, the modular synthesizers scare the hell out of me. But this was something super simple, super powerful for the average person. Uh, it, it's probably easier if I give you a demo now. So, so, so the whole thing is centered around um, like an analog four-track tape machine. And that's the kind of, yeah, the, you can see this kind of icon on the top. And what that means is... Um, <coughs> Yeah, so now I'm rewinding, and I can I can juggle through the four tracks. Ground control to Major Tom. So that's, uh, that's the tape track. We, we also uh, built in an FM radio. Um, so so I, can, I can actually sample from the radio onto a drum track. Um, right now it's, it, it has a lot of drum sounds, but, but if I plug in the radio, okay, I think this is PBS or something. So yeah, so I can basically record 20 seconds of, of audio from the radio or, or the microphone. Um, and, and once I do that, it's going to map it onto the keys, and I can I can start to play around with it a little bit. Okay, so. Okay, so I like that one. And I can add some effects as well. Yeah, so it, it's kind of easy to, to manipulate the sound, um, which, which I think is really cool. Basically, because we're such a small company, we, we kind of have to follow the trends a little bit. So that means that when we built this, um, it, it kind of has the same things in it that you had in a cell phone in 2005. So the display, um, it, basically it's from a Samsung flip phone. And, and today now you have a lot of companies doing smart watches. So if we want to build a product with a display, it's probably going to be like really tiny. Um, so, so it's a lot about finding the technology that's already out there and thinking about how that could be used to, to have more fun, I guess. With the display, we also wanted to think about, you know, could we could we display something more than just information? Could we make it a bit more fun? So in this example, uh, we have an effect, and uh, you can probably guess, but it's, it, the idea is that it makes the sound more punchy. Uh, but it could also be a little bit more logical. 
uh, like here you have a, a cow with four stomachs and there's, f there's also four knobs on the synthesizer and each of the stomachs is affected by when you turn the knob. We also love accessories. Um, I I this series I is designed to work with Lego. It's Lego compatible, so you could build like a, a small robot with Lego Mindstorms and have that help you play music. So I, I, my favorite is the crank. It's like a, yeah, tiny little crank arm that, that I can put on one of the knobs. And I can, if I want, I can play like a, yeah, simple jazz scale. And now I can take the crank, turn it on. I, kind of, I can kind of do this guitar solo kind of thing. And I, we built in an accelerometer, so, so I can, if I lift it up, it's going to make the sound a bit more crispy. <laughs> cool, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Some of our more notable users, Beck was a, a beta tester, Depeche, Depeche Mode used it a lot on their latest album, uh, Andy Rubin bought 10, uh, <laughs> I, I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> this is Sean Lennon, John Lennon's son, he actually started a festival uh, where you, all the bands were using OP1, that, I mean that, that kind of community is exactly, I mean it's just so rewarding for us. Yeah, so, some, some awards. Uh, okay, OD11, our second product. Uh, I think to create the first product, it's, it's, it's quite easy, or, or at least it's easier than, you know, sophomore syndrome kind of thing. So the second product is what defines you. It, it, it's like with a band, the XX's second album, you know. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, we, we, we didn't want to do just a synthesizer, so instead we built a loudspeaker. But we didn't really know much about loudspeakers when we set out. Um, so we collaborated with these old Swedish guys called the Carlson Foundation. Basically in the 70s, there was this acoustic engineer called uh, Stig Carlson, and he was building loudspeakers that were designed to sound good in apartment environments. So they kind of threw the sound around the room and, and, and used the reflective surfaces to, to kind of embellish or improve the sound. That's, that's very different to the way that a lot of studio monitors are built. They're kind of uh, tuned in an anechoic chamber um, meant to sound good in a room that doesn't have any reflections. Uh, we found some, some of the old engineers and they actually gave us the drawings to the original speakers. Uh, so we kind of, yeah, I mean, you can see the similarity. Um, why fix it if it ain't broke? We, what we did was we built a Linux computer inside of it. Uh, and I guess the idea was to reimagine the loudspeaker as as a machine that could have an active part in the listening process. So instead of just being a dumb box that you plug a cable into and it, and it takes the audio and spits it out, not that well, it, it kind of has this awareness, like a history. So, I mean, imagine if, if the speaker knew what it had played before and what was coming next. I think you can do a lot with that. So we also built a, a remote control. Uh, the form factor is exactly the same as a Swedish snusdusa, which is like a small tin of tobacco that every Swedish man has in his back pocket. Um, <laughs> and, and, and when you turn it, we really wanted it to feel like, you know, when you would run into the lounge room and, and play with your dad's stereo. It kind of felt like launching a spaceship or something, that kind of yeah. <laughs> Um, there's also l like colored variants and each one of those, each remote can be linked to a playlist in Spotify. So every member of a household has their color and, and they have their playlist that they can access at any time. We build an app, we have a strong connection to the tangible and, and yeah, so, so the app is basically just the auto remote. <laughs> uh, and we launched that at the Museum of Modern Art Design Store in December 2014. Uh, and yeah, pe people seem to like it. Um, I think that we're not, we're not so afraid of, of not having all the answers. That's one of the special things about Teenage. In this case, we built a box uh, or a platform, I guess, that, that we hope we can continue to build for years to come. It's a little bit like a cell phone. The more devices you have connected, the more you can do with it. Here's a concept for a wireless turntable. It comes flat packed. Uh, so, so you have a bit of fun when you, when you receive it and you put it together, but it also helps us save on costs. 
The idea with this one is, is that it works with timecode vinyl, just like DJs use. But in this case, it's connected to Spotify playlists. So you have colored records, and each one of those links to a playlist in Spotify, which you can change at any time. But all of a sudden, your grandmother can use it. I think we're, we're all about pulling people away from the computer and the phone and, and encouraging some kind of interaction with music, active over passive listening. That's really important to us. The third product line that, that we released last year is called the Pocket Operators. The, the OP1 synthesizer sells for $849. It's, it's not so accessible. Uh, so we wanted to build a machine for more people. Uh, we set out with the pocket operators to sell them for $49, uh, but there was, yeah, uh, we failed that, uh, and so it's $59. <laughs> uh, but everything we're doing is, is with the goal of growing the synthesizer population. Uh, so we also had to experiment with a new model for distribution. So in this case, we collaborated with Cheap Monday, uh, who gave us access to over 1,500 fashion stores. And, and for the first launch, we, we uh, released three different versions. And then we started to release them in, in time with the, the kind of fashion cycle of releasing products, too. So that was new for us. It's probably easier if I do a demo. Um, yeah, I, I guess the idea was to, to kind of create something that was more like a game, uh, easier to play. But we also have this idea of maybe creating a new genre of music or, or a new musical movement. So imagine if. Imagine if you create, like, a, you, you, you start a festival, but instead of booking any artists, when people arrive to the festival, they get a synthesizer of their choosing, and they have five minutes slot to play on stage. So, yeah, we can imagine that's what I'm doing now, and I'm a guy who's never played this before. Um, so I'm just going to set it up for you. It's, yeah, it's really thin. It's basically just a PCB, but I think it's quite a powerful, quite a fun machine. So now I just have a, a drum beat and I can add some other stuff. And this is really easy to program. It, it just has 16 buttons that, uh, that I can kind of play around with. It's more like a Game Boy. You can add some, maybe a chord progression. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite powerful. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I guess every, everything with this one was built around the cost. So, so the, the overall form factor of, of the machine is, is designed so that we can fit 2,000 of them on a pallet. And, and we also integrated uh, the hanger, which, you, which, which is used to hang the product in the store, right into the PCB. And that allowed us to save 50 cents. Uh, but, but that one's not not only about the cost, it's also a way of, I guess, communicating to the customer that they, they shouldn't be so afraid to use it. It's the same with the packaging. It, it, it kind of has this tab on the side, like uh, yeah, a little bit like a candy box. So, uh, so you just have to rip that open, and then you can get started. I think, that's, I, I think it's really interesting, because it means that you know, packaging can also be in opposition to exclusivity. I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the feedback points that we got was that yeah, pe people were a little bit unhappy that we skimped on the plastic case. Um, and, and so we decided to release the engineering drawings for the device uh, and encourage people to build their own. Uh, and there was some cool stuff. This was really, really exciting for us. Uh, I mean, and it, and it really ties back into our idea about platform thinking. When you can, when you can take the, you know, the most challenging 
parts and the limitations in a situation and completely turn them on their head to kind of distill a product into, into something that's as simple as possible to, to both play and produce. Uh, I think that's really cool. Um, we're not really designers. We, we don't care about, about being designers. We're builders and engineers. And I, I think any, any design is a result of that. If, if there is one rule that we follow, it's that of the silhouette. I think it's really cool if you can see an object for the first time, walk away from it and sketch the silhouette on a napkin, then you know you've done a good job. So we've shipped 100K of these so far, um, which is really big for us. That we didn't sell as many of the other ones, um, and we're releasing more in the future. Uh, I can talk a little bit about, oh, time's up, time's up. Can I keep going? Cool. A little bit about our process. Um, we're not really into thinking, like I said. We, uh, we prefer to learn from building. Uh, so we build a lot of boxes, prototypes, uh, computers, pens. What if you could draw music? We did that one, and it, it didn't sound so good. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, I think we have this, this DIY thing going on. Um, we're not afraid to try new stuff and, and, and to fail. And that, that ties into our name, Teenage Engineering. What is a company? We started a band. We want the whole company to be an experiment. So if we have an idea, we just try it. We're going on tour this year with Bon Iver. It's like getting paid to do PR. But, but it's, not, it's not really about that. It, it's about trying new things and, and, <laughs> you know, and, and field testing the machines. We're also not, not that into being secretive about development. So after four months of development on this one, the OP0, we kind of preview that to the public. Um, uh, sure, there's a lot to go, but I think it's so much more interesting to be open about these things. And you know, we always find our own way of doing, doing things. Uh, with this device, we, we got rid of the screen, which is really challenging to solve all of the user interface stuff. But then we started thinking, wh what if you could use the, the screens, the displays that people have in their pockets or in their home? Take your TV, for example. Then it starts to be really interesting to think about you know, what, what, if it, what if an interface isn't just uh, a metaphor for information, but it's, it's actually something, it, like it's a two-way thing. Imagine if you could feed it, in this case, with, with musical information, and it, and it takes that and, and kind of generates something original, something that could be inspiring for you. What happens when, when we move away from, from interfaces just being metaphors for information in the real world to something completely different? I think that's really interesting. Thanks.